and the police had to intervene and create this human barricade to keep these two people apart. You can just imagine. Now, I, I was there. I remember the tension. You were walking on campus and you thought blood was going to spill any minute. It was that intense, right? You're walking by, you see somebody who's black, you see somebody who's white. You were worried that a fight would break out. Like it was a very, very intense moment. And the president of the university was going to give a speech and he turns up to give this speech and everybody is expecting some serious consequence for this fraternity house, the suspension of the fraternity, something like that. And he gives a speech in which he says, this is America, we have to learn to appreciate freedom of speech. Well, the audience did not like this. The audience rushes the stage. The security has to throw the, the president of the university on their shoulder, run into the campus administration building and lock the doors. You can just imagine the tension. Some students started going on a hunger strike. I mean, it was a serious moment of crisis. This is a conversation with Dwayne Veron, host of the Society Builders podcast dedicated to how individuals and communities can transform the world. I was born in America, but my parents were both Persian. And um, when I turned nine, we went, they moved back to Iran. So I went to, I couldn't speak any Farsi. You know, it was a, a challenging time uh, for me learning to, to speak Farsi and, and stuff. I was in a bilingual school. Um, the school I was in was English in the morning and then Farsi in the afternoon. So I had to start from first grade again and work my way back up. It was accelerated. Um, but what was really interesting is the teachers in my morning were, you know, English, American, like they were Western. And the teachers in the afternoon were, were Persian. And um, we had a religion class always. And on the first day of the religion class every year, I'm sure this is a story that you've heard from others as well, but the, the teacher would say, everybody who's not a Muslim, stand up. Some of us would stand up. And then the teacher would say, okay, everybody who's a Christian, you can sit down. Sorry, they'd start with Jews. They'd say, everybody who's a Jew, you can sit down. So, because the Quran mentions Moses, so you're okay. Then they'd say, all the Christians, you can sit down because the Quran mentions Christ, so you're okay. I'm, I'm the only one left standing. And she would say, son, what's your religion? And I would say, teacher, I'm a Baha'i. And the teacher would slap the ruler on the table and say, no, the Baha'i is not a religion. Um, and then she would turn to the class, usually with an admonition. And it usually went something like, now class, Duane is a Baha'i. Be very careful. Do not touch him. Be even careful that you don't follow him too closely. Because Baha'is give off these little microscopic worms that said Kermak. And if you're not careful, these worms will, will get into you and eat you out from inside out. And um, of course that resulted in kids teasing me. Uh, one year I got beat up by somebody because I was a Baha'i. Um, all of that was very much kind of like par. That, it wasn't everybody, most people felt that that was kind of like silly and just ignored it. But there were some kids who really kind of took it to heart and um, we would always get teased and, you know, all of that for being Baha'is. It was all part of the course. What's always fascinated me, though, is that I never look back at that persecution as in any way having disempowered me. I remember one year, maybe I was 10, and I remember three teachers came to class to debate me and to explain why. And there were really silly arguments, like if Baha'u'llah really was a messenger of God, how come his book didn't win a Pulitzer Prize? I mean, this was the, the kind of logic that went into this. Um, but, you know, from a young age, I learned to stand up for what I believe in. And I always find it interesting because when you look at a persecuted people, usually the consequence is there's a, a very negative effect on that community. But I think that particularly with religious communities, you often don't see that. And I think it's because the persecutor don't buy into it. We don't think of ourselves as inferior. Um, you believe that, you know, you're just as good as the other guy. And, and sometimes actually you have to work harder to prove it. Um, but certainly those years were life forming in terms of teaching me to stand up for what I believe in. How does this tie into the question of political non-involvement. Well, um, you know, the, 
The story of political non-involvement, the history of how that principle evolves in the faith is actually very interesting. Most Baha'is don't really know the story. But, you know, what happened was um, in the late 19th century, there was a prime minister in Iran who had an appetite and a desire to see political reform. And this was very unusual. This was not the norm. So he was very much out of step with his predecessors. And he called for ideas, you know, for, and really cultivated a discourse around this idea of what was the political reform that was necessary for Iran. And it's in response to that discourse that Abdu'l-Bahá writes The Secret of Divine Civilization. So he is sharing these ideas anonymously, and the reason he's doing it anonymously is he does not want this to be perceived as something he's doing for political favor, like to be on the good side of the prime minister or anything like that. He shares these ideas anonymously, and the Baha'i community was very instrumental in propagating those ideas. And so um, it was actually the second book to be distrib published and distributed in Iran. So it was published in India and the Baha'is brought it in and they widely distributed this book. And all over the country there was Baha'i communities that were very engaged in this discourse around the need for this kind of reform. So really, um, you know, the Baha'i community was very heavily engaged with this discourse. And um, if you look at Iranian society and you think of this in terms of what would emerge as the constitution ultimately in Iran in the early 20th century, um, that movement was a handful of intellectuals in the capital who were advocating these ideas. But if you look at that movement outside of the intellectuals in the capital and maybe a few other key cities, the movement to make that a national discourse was entirely a Baha'i contribution. And even further, the movement to make that a discourse in which both men and women participated. And the discourse at that time had a strand that was about the rights of women. That's entirely a Baha'i contribution. So it's Baha'is who make that truly a national discourse. In the smallest villages in Iran, you have a discourse around the constitution, you know, these things, and they are being driven and stimulated by these small Baha'i communities. Um, so now flash forward to the actual emergence of a constitution in Iran, 1907-ish, something around that time period, 1906, 1907. And um, now what happens is the nature of the movement changes. The clergy get very involved in this discourse and the clerics have a different agenda. And in a lot of ways, what was a pro kind of like agency, pro-democracy kind of movement becomes an anti-monarchy movement. And it all becomes about freedom from the oppression of the Shah, that kind of thing. And, in the, and you can imagine if you're a Baha'i at this time, the birth of this constitution is an incredibly gratifying experience. And a lot of the, the rhetoric and the dialogue was actually very, very, very Baha'i inspired. So for example, people were calling for houses of justice. Where do they get the word house of justice? Like this is Baha'i terminology. Nobody else, they're using the Persian version of what, I mean, Beit al is Arabic, um, but they use the Persian version of this and Dolat uh, Khane, something like that. Um, but, um, you know, so if you're a Baha'i at that time, you're feeling good. Hey, for 30 years we've been advocating for this. Now it's happening. Wow, this is amazing, right? Like it feels very fulfilling. And in the middle of that, at that key moment, Abdu'l-Bahá writes the community and says, completely disengage. And a lot of this understanding that we have about our non-involvement in politics really comes from this. And Abdu'l-Bahá explains that this movement, which was unifying, has actually now become disunifying. And that now it's become a movement you know, against the Shah, not about how we can create rights for people and justice and all these things. And so the Baha'i community in obedience 
completely disengages. With the exception of a handful of believers, everybody else disengages. And Abdu'l Baha says, now focus your efforts on social reform. And so that effort goes into creating Baha'i schools, health clinics, you know, this kind of thing, social action as we would think of it today. So what we learn from this story is that um, our approach to the social issues of our day has to be really framed in a positive framework where we are working towards a vision and not in a negative framework, which is working against the people. So if you think about it, it's the difference between um, fighting racism, which is not our game. Our game is to promote race unity. We're not out there to say, this person is a racist, he's an evil person, he's a terrible person, let's cancel him. That's not our game. Our game is about visualizing the positive state we're trying to create and creating a unifying momentum around building that vision. It's a very, very, very different kind of process. And so this is a lot of the reason why I think we don't engage in partisan politics because by definition, partisan is inherently divisive. This principle of first having a vision and then going towards it is something that the Universal House of Justice has spoken about for decades and decades. And there's actually a letter written to two individuals in 1987, I believe, where they say that the, the world right now, most people don't have a clear vision of the positive future they want to build. And as a result of that, people's moral characters are judged based on the, e the evils that they fight against. And this was 1987, and we see that so much today. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I have a good friend, uh, Roy Steiner, Dr. Roy Steiner, who um, has an interesting project. He's at the Rockefeller Foundation, and he, he sponsored this project, which was people in his space, which is agriculture, articulating a vision of what they want to build. And the reason this is such a powerful idea is because when you think about um, the future, in literature, in movies, in, in, in entertainment, in anything like that, it's always dystopian, 99% of the time. It's actually very hard to think of the 1%, but it's almost always, you know, zombies, uh, collapse, uh, everything is negative. You never see a vision of the future, you know, that is, that is positive. Um, so this paradigm that that Baha'is have really of, of, you know, of what we would call fashioning. And what I mean by fashioning is God fashions the universe. There's a vision and it unfolds, but it unfolds gradually. It doesn't happen in an instant. It all kind of like unfolds to this vision. And this is the, the uh, gift of being able to, the skill of being able to bring vision to fruition and it's organic in character it doesn't happen quickly it happens slowly but you recognize the direction that you're moving in so the way that i would articulate that is that it's like you know society is here or society is here i should say society is here and there are things and and let, let me think about that again we're here and there are things that we consider abnormal, that we consider wrong, that we think are not right. Like I was traveling in New Zealand and, you know, there was, people would leave their doors open. You know, it was a very trusting society. Crime starts to happen. And the next thing you know, it goes down. Your, your standard goes down and you get used to it. You get used to it. And so it just becomes normal. Um, I was in South Africa once and I was talking to this person. I said, oh my God, crime here is so bad. And they go, it's just like anywhere else. I go, but you have, you know, carjackings here all the time. And she goes, oh my God, that is so exaggerated. It's only happened to me once. <laughs> yeah. And this is what happens. We just accept. We just accept. And then what happens is there's a new level of, there's a new standard for down. And then we go down further. And then, but when you have vision, even though you may only be approaching that vision in baby steps, what it does is it creates a sense of gravity in the direction that you want society to move. And so we may not move in leaps and bounds, but we're moving consistently 
in this direction of the vision that we want to bring to fruition. Even in psychology, uh, in our brains, positive emotion, emotion is elicited when we make progress towards a meaningful goal. So if we don't have a goal, then there's no positive emotion. There's no motivation for movement. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, we, uh, we want to be proactive in our lives, not just reactive to the challenges and stresses that we face ultimately. Bringing this to a more scientific discussion, could you tell me about some of the scientific studies that you've been engaged in and then also the Baha'i process is very much scientific, so speaking to that. <laughs> so the House of Justice often talks about, you know, the method of science. And, um, you know, the method of science is about truth-seeking. Science is falsifiable, which means you don't preordain the result. You don't go into a study saying the result of the study is that we're going to find X. You go into it, you may have a hypothesis, but you're testing the hypothesis. And the result may be no, the result may be you're wrong. And that's just, uh, in, in pure terms, that's just as good as if the result is yes. Why? Because you learn from that. It's all about learning. It's all about discovering truth, right? That's the game we should be involved in. And certainly in my business, that's what we do. So what we do in my business is, we are in the truth business. We don't try to do something to get a particular outcome. We really genuinely want to know, is this good? Is this bad? We break myths in our industry all the time. Um, we have a campaign coming up in the month of October where for 30 days, every day, we're going to bust a myth in our industry based on our data, based on the studies that we've conducted. So, you know, this is what science is about. It's the core essence of what science is about transparency, uh, replicability. If it's a truth, it should happen again. You know, uh, these are core principles around how science works. Now, personally, and again, this is just my personal perspective, my understanding of what this means in our Baha'i community life is that when we go about our activities, the method of our learning needs to impartially look at evidence to understand how we can best navigate towards truth. So um, I'm just gonna make up a fictitious example. You know, um, you are in your community and you want to have uh, a, a, a teaching event which is, you know, take people to bowling alleys and have them bowl and whatever it is, right? Now that's a crazy, you know, unrealistic example, but I'm just doing it. And you don't know if that's a good idea or a bad idea. You have no way of knowing you think it's a good idea, you have a hypothesis, but you have to ultimately test it. So you go out there, you pass out invitations, you do, and then you look and see, okay, did we get a good result? Did we not get a good result? What does our data tell us? Maybe you try different things. Let's try bowling on a Monday night. Let's try bowling on a Tuesday night. You can try different things, but the arbiter of truth is your data. It's not your view. It's not your preordained view. Personally, I think Baha'i communities, from what I've seen, don't really understand this idea of the method of science. I don't think this is actually a very common thing that we see in our community. We, we collect data, yes. What do we do? We pass it on to somebody else. We collect the data, we send it to the World Center, and we wait for the great insight to descend from the heavens telling us what we've learned. My understanding really is that that kind of data collection has to drive our initiatives, that that's part of what reflection inherently means. And what that means is that we can't always have success. I think that oftentimes people think of the data collection as being a cheerleading exercise, a marketing exercise. It's not. Sometimes you have failures, you learn from failures. Sometimes you have success, you learn from success. You should have both in the mix. If all you have is success, and no failures, it's probably not an honest um, process. So this is the challenge that I see is to align what we do more with the method of science and also transparency. We have areas that I think is room for growth and we have areas that I think are real strengths. This is one of those areas where I think there's room for growth in our community life. What do you think are some of the, the easiest levers to, to press for improving this area? So don't think about it as complicated. 
right? You don't need a statistician. This is not about using conjoint analysis and figuring out how you can bring the power of conjoint analysis to your, to your question. Um, you want to know what data have your cluster reflection meeting. You say, you know what, let's experiment. This month, you know, this quarter, let's try it on a Saturday. Next quarter, let's try it on a Sunday. Let's compare the results. Oh, look, we got 30 people when we do it this way. We got 50 people when we do it. Turns out this is better. You know, just learn to make the data part of the consultative process, part of the reflection, not to think that that's in somebody else's hands. So own it, have it be a part of the process, keep it simple. It doesn't have to be complex. Just even at a simple level, looking at trying to understand data, that's what it's about. Thank you. You host the podcast Society Builders. At a basic level, what is Society Builders? <laughs> I love hosting Society Builders. <laughs> it's a real passion for me. So what happened was um, on December 30, when, of 2021, when the message from the House of Justice came out announcing the new plans and that this would have a singular focus on society building, right? I, that was in the second paragraph. I read that sentence and I was overwhelmed instantly. I was like, wow, society building, singular focus. Wow, that's a powerful construct. Can you imagine how much we're going to learn about this over the next 25 years? I know nothing about it today. I don't know what that means, but can you imagine? And one of my personal frustrations was the plans of the 25 years, I always felt like I was lagging behind. I never knew what was going on. New constructs would come in. I'm like, I, what, what is, I haven't heard that. What is that? You know, and I was, I was always playing catch up and I always felt like I was two steps behind. Like, you know, what are they all talking about? What's going on? You know, and I feel like, you know, people who were heavily engaged at an institutional level were often in the know, but the rest of the community was really playing catch up with it often, right? And we didn't understand what was going on and it was all very kind of like hard to follow. And, you know, it became easier over time. You know, you became used to like what accompaniment means, but it took a while for each of those constructs to kind of like, you know, ha for, for me to understand what they were. And um, I didn't want to have that happen again. I was determined that with these next plans, I wasn't going to be a laggard. I was going to be up with it as it was happening. And so I decided that if I hosted a podcast series, it would force me to have to stay on top of it all. And so it was really more a tool for my own deepening than anything. Um, and the fact that you know, other people have been able to join in that journey is just a bonus. Um, but it's just, uh, it's such a, uh, such a joy really hosting the series. It's just been, because it, it nourishes my soul. I get so much personal fulfillment in the discovery around every episode, the things I learned in every episode. Oh, it just fills my soul. I, I love doing the series. Are there any stories of what you would classify as society building that you feel personally are particularly powerful? Um, oh, for sure. Uh, I was at the EBBF conference in uh, Lisbon a few months ago, and um, there was somebody there from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And, you know, the DRC is a failed state. You know, it's a place where everything is broken down. And I mean, like, there's no schools, the schools aren't functioning, you know, the roads don't get repaired, um, no, the electricity is not available. I mean, everything about the functions of the state have broken down, right? It's um, a very, very difficult place to live in a lot of those ways. But it's remarkable to see what the Baha'i community has done. And it's remarkable to see how the Baha'i community has engaged wider society and how receptive wider society is to engaging with the Baha'i community in society building. So they are responding. So this, this gentleman from the DRC was telling us some of the stories of the things they're working on, and it was so inspiring. So just to give you a little bit of, of context here, there are maybe 100,000 Baha'is, if I remember it correctly, in the DRC, but there's 700,000 people from the larger community who are, who are working with the Baha'is. 
that's really the essence of what it means to be a catalyst for this larger community of change, right? And one of the stories he was telling was about, you know, this community that doesn't have a school. And so the Baha'is there said, well, we can't have our kids not be educated, so we need to, we need to get a school going in this community. And so they decided to, you know, gather their funds together and, and build a school. And um, the builder came and, you know, they said, okay, one of our conditions it, for giving you this contract to build this school is that you have to employ local, uh, local people for your labor. I'm like, but you don't have people who are trained in this. Well, you're going to have to train them. And so now the people who are building the school are actually being trained in how to build a school, you know, by the contractor. And then meanwhile, while the school is being built, they're training the teachers. And so the te I mean, what an incredible story, you know, a story of agency, you know, a story of empowerment, a story of, you know, people developing capacity. I mean, it's just such a powerful example. Um, and the thing that we have to remember is that that we will be seeing this in spades. I mean, we are going to see all kinds of incredibly exciting and unpredictable ways that we will be contributing to our societies over the course of the next two plus decades. Unpredictable? We don't know what it looks like. We're a nascency on this. We're grappling with what society building looks like. We will discover it over the course of these these next two and a half uh, decades. I think well, a big part of this is the process of disintegration that's ongoing, that anytime you look at anything in the news, it's like, okay, that's disintegration. And society building is a big part of the integrative process. What gives you hope about, about humanity moving forward? Well, um, the disintegration distresses me enormously. Um, it affects my soul. Um, I, I, I don't think that anybody should have this idea that we are immune to the pain of the world around us. We feel the pain just as much as everybody else does. Um, but the thing is that what is happening is that trust in all institutions are gone, eroded, disintegrated. Even in science, like even science has now been politicized and even the credibility of science. You know, journalists now have a credibility that is on par with politicians. How on earth could that happen, right? I mean, it's remarkable to see every institution in society has eroded away. And yes, that is devastating. That is horrible. That is terrible, right? However, there is a hunger for change that is really unprecedented and that will grow. You know, the House of Justice talks about the symbiosis between the integration and the disintegration. You know, as one accelerates, the other accelerates. So as the disintegration accelerates, the forces of instant integration accelerate. And so this hunger, this desire, and where does that ultimately get channeled if you are in a world where trust in all institutions is gone. Where does that get channeled? And it gets channeled in the idea of agency. Don't look to what somebody else can do. Let's focus on what we can do. And this is this process, which I think Baha'is will very, very meaningfully contribute to, which is this idea of empowering people to create to cultivate the conditions for elevating their own situations and not expecting somebody else to come in and fix their problem for them, which is very much the modern mindset. The modern mindset, we're not responsible for doing anything. We've delegated that responsibility to somebody else. This is a real twist, a real change on that paradigm. And so it all comes down to empowering people to develop the capacity to respond to the needs of their age. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it becomes or comes down to the individual or rather the individual within a collective, within a community. Yeah, to... So this is the three protagonists. This kind of capacity building happens for the individual. Yes, that's what the Institute process for us cultivates. It happens for uh, the institutions. The institutions also have to grow and have to develop their capacity. 
I'll tell you a story in a second about that. And then there is also the community. And that is really reflected in this idea that we think of as culture. And so all three protagonists really have to go through this process of capacity building. Let, let me go back to this idea of the institutions and how capacity... I think, I think Baha'is now have a good sense of what capacity building means for the individual. I think we can visualize that. But now let me shift and talk about what personally I think this, institu this capacity building will increasingly look like for our institutions. So many moons ago, when I was in college, um, my university, we created, uh, we um, would meet before the semester started and we would plan out our semester. And one year we got together and we planned out and we said, well, what should we do? And we said, let's host a conference on race unity. And so we did that. And we were very uh, ahead of the curve for our day, so to speak, because we recognized that we had to be catalysts for a larger discourse in our community, not us. So we went to all of the organizations in town that had anything to do with race unity. We met with all the black churches, you know, uh, the, 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 the pastors and the priests and the ministers at the churches. We met with the NAACP, with the Urban League, like everyone. And we invited them all to speak at our conference, right? And we had a Baha'i speaker, Nat Rutstein, who had just written a book called To Be One, a beautiful book where he deals with his own prejudices. This was really radical. A Baha'i is writing a book about his own prejudices and how he grappled with and conquered his own prejudices, right? So we invited Nat to speak at our conference. And um, we put posters all over campus. You know, we had posters and, and um, and it was about, you know, three weeks into the semester, so we had some time to publicize it and everything. The weekend before our conference, there were race riots in this town in America. This was one of these situations which happens every now and then, where the police came in, some black students were killed. It wasn't at our university, it was in Virginia Beach. Um, but it was a very bad incident, you know, not as strong as George Floyd, but you can visualize it was one of those moments where there were some riots, there was protests, you know, it became the topical issue. And two days later, there was this conference on race unity where all of the leaders of race in Austin, Texas, where we were, where they were all going to speak, right? Well, you can imagine what happened. Our conference was packed to capacity. We were a small group. We thought maybe we would get 30, 40 people to come to this conference. We had over 500 people come to this conference, right? It was a big deal. And Nat gave the keynote address. And in his speech, he said, um, the Baha'i Club at this university, this is at the University of Texas, the Baha'i Club at this university should, should sponsor an organization called Racism Anonymous to help people deal with their own prejudices. Well, this was just a line in his speech. The next day we got inundated with calls from people who wanted to join. So we call Nat and we're like, Nat, we have all these people who want to join Racism Anonymous. What is it? How does it work? He says, I don't know. I just said it. <laughs> so we went to the library. In those days, we didn't have the internet. We had to go to the library. We read books on Alcoholics Anonymous. Our first meetings were literally, we went around the room and said, hi, my name is Duane and I'm a racist. You know, it was like, this was the, the kind of thing that we had. And it took a while. Very soon, we discovered that that the dynamic that we needed was to create a dialogue between the races. So a black student says, you know, when I walk down the street, I see you to like a white girl. I see you walking and I see you grab your purse tighter when I walk by you and that hurts me. And the girl saying, well, you know, you always assume that I'm a racist, that hurts me. Like it was a dialogue between, and that was unique. We were filling a unique space in the race discourse this dialogue between black and white, right? Flash forward now many months, eight months later, and it was April, and uh, it was Greek week on campus, which is this week where fraternities have parties. And every party has a theme, like, you know, maybe it's a toga party and they come dressed as Romans, and, you know, everybody is trying to outdo each other. One of these fraternities 
had this idea of having a car in their backyard. So they often have their own little house that they buy and you know, it's their fraternity house. And so they had a car in the backyard, a used car. And they basically had everybody get baseball bats and write something on the car and jump up and down and smash the car. You know, maybe you broke up with your girlfriend, write the name of your girlfriend, go up there and dash it. This was kind of like the, the childish kind of like idea that they had. Now, as it happened, for whatever reason, most of the things that they wrote on this car ended up being anti-black racial ap epitaphs. So fraternities are very racially segregated. This was a white fraternity and they were writing all these horrible, nasty things about African-Americans on this car and somebody took a photo. And the next day, there was a picture on the Austin American Statesman, the front cover of all these college kids on this car with these bats, with these racial epitaphs smashing this car. Well, the black students on campus were outraged. They formed a huge group. They went to the fraternity house and instead of being apologetic, the, the fraternity house put up these anti-black posters and things like that. And the black students were going to rush and destroy the house and the police had to intervene and create this human barricade to keep these two people apart. You can just imagine. Now, I, I was there. I remember the tension. You were walking on campus and you thought blood was going to spill any minute. It was that intense, right? You're walking by, you see somebody who's black, you see somebody who's white. You were worried that a fight would break out. Like it was a very, very intense moment. And the president of the university was going to give a speech and he turns up to give this speech and everybody is expecting some serious consequence for this fraternity house, the suspension of the fraternity, something like that. And he gives a speech in which he says, this is America, we have to learn to appreciate freedom of speech. Well, the audience did not like this. The audience rushes the stage. The security has to throw the, the president of the university on their shoulder, run into the campus administration building and lock the doors. You can just imagine the tension. Some students started going on a hunger strike. I mean, it was a serious moment of crisis. In the midst of this crisis, the FBI approaches the university and they say, your situation's out of control. Blood is gonna spill. This situation cannot be unaddressed. You have to resolve this. You have to address this. We have mediators who we will send to you, who can mediate and help you with this issue. And the university administrators did not want this. They thought this would be bad publicity for the university. So they said, you know what? We have our own resources at this university. We have a group here called Racism Anonymous. They will help us. And the next thing you know, we get a call from the university. Can you help us? That is the future from Baha'i institutions. Baha'i institutions are not institutions for the Baha'i community. They are institutions for the community. And as the community comes to discover that, increasingly, they will call on the Baha'i institutions for help. They will call on the Baha'i community for help. And we will have to grow our capacity and learn to respond. And so this is the challenge that we face. There are places where that started to happen. Yes. I know villages in the DRC where the chief of the village regularly consults with the local spiritual assembly on any matters that come to him. Yes, and it will happen in pockets. It will happen where, oh, if this is an issue associated with, you know, in, in our community, for example, um, We've become very active in the mental health discourse. And now we're seen as a resource for mental health. And so it may not happen where, you know, it's grand, but it may happen in certain corridors. Um, but all of this is something that we have to grow for because we're not used to it. We're not used to thinking of ourselves as being, you know, servants of the larger community. We're used to thinking of ourselves as, you know, being within our small communities. Can you tell me about how Abdul Baha approached society building? Episode six, yes. Um, so when I was doing society builders, one of the very first things that I 
did, you know, one of those earlier episodes was I wanted to do a bird's eye view of the history of Baha'i approaches to society building. And, you know, I wanted to go into things like Baha'i radio in Bolivia, you know, the New Era School in, in, in India, you know, these types of things. And as I began to map this story, what I discovered was that like over 90% of what we've done, really, we did at the time of Abdu'l Baha. And the Baha'is of that generation, what they achieved is truly unbelievable and remarkable. And as Baha'is, we don't know that story. What's really amazing about it is that most modern social movements were also born at that time, around the time of the travels of Abdu'l Baha in America, like the civil rights movement. Remember, Abdu'l Baha spoke at the fourth annual conference of the NAACP, fourth right? Like the NAACP was nascent. So these social movements were in nascency. Their followings, you know, their membership was very small. And of course, the Baha'i community was very small. In all of the Western Baha'i world, there were probably around 3,000 Baha'is. But you have Abdu'l Baha. And Abdu'l Baha is very directly guiding so much of this. And I would encourage you, you know, the listeners to this, to really listen to episode six. If you only listen to one episode in society, listen to episode six, which is about how Abdu'l Baha approaches society building and how the Baha'is of that generation really responded to this. And it's so much more powerful than we realize because most modern social movements today, I believe, have key constructs within them which were directly influenced by the Baha'is of that generation. So um, if you look, for example, at affirmative action, just to use one example, well, where did that come from? That came from W.E.B. Du Bois, who was the, one of the co-founders of the NAACP, very influential person who came up with this idea. But you know, uh, there are Baha'i historians who've done research now and who have found correspondence which W.E.B. Du Bois writes, where he writes to his colleague and he says, oh, look at this paragraph by Shoghi Effendi in Advent of Divine Justice. And they quote the paragraph where Shoghi Effendi is saying, if there's an election and it's a tie, that the tiebreaker should be decided by the, the minority, right? Um, and, so you, and, and Du Bois' wife, Nina, was a Baha'i. And he would speak at Baha'i summer school. So he was very actively interacting with the Baha'i community. And in very similar ways, in all these movements, you have these profound and deep influences, which we largely don't even really know a lot about. For example, one of the things I discovered in my research was that Ida Wells had embraced the faith. Ida Wells is, she was a black journalist who posthumously was awarded a Pulitzer Prize. She is an icon for journalists. She's so incredible. And we don't know the story of her journey. We know that we have a, that, that she's on our membership role, you know, but we don't know the story of what her journey was. So there's so much for us to discover, but I would highly encourage you because there's so much that we can learn from how Abdu'l Baha engaged with society building. You did a deep dive on polarization and depolarization. Can you tell me some of what you learned about that? Yeah, so um, the background to that was in Society Builders, in the podcast series, we eventually get to, you know, it's, it's uh, 33 episodes so far, and we still haven't covered the basics of what society building is. So we're working our way through. And we got to the section where we were talking about discourse. And um, what is discourse? How does the Baha'i concept of discourse, how is that different to the way that others in society might think of discourse? what differentiates our approach, that kind of thing. And I wanted to give an example by going into some discourse, engaging with some discourse, and showing how we go about the process of engaging with the discourse. And to be fair to the audience, I wanted to be in the same boat that the audience was in, which is I wanted to know nothing about it, because oftentimes that's the case. You are approaching a discourse that you know nothing about. You're not an expert in that discourse, so you have to start from scratch. And uh, the guidance that we have is our starting point is often to look to the scientific literature, to look to the human experience and understand what have we learned about this, this problem. 
So this first step would be to do that. So what topic? Um, there was a sentence in the December 30th, 2021 message where the House of Justice calls on us to often have to bring previously antagonistic groups closer together. And when I read that sentence, I thought, that just seems like almost impossible. Like, how are we going to bring antagonistic groups closer together? Like, that just seems overwhelming as a, as a vision. And so, um, and also, all of the guidance that we're getting from the House of Justice when they're talking about the state of the world, they're using the word polarized. And so I thought, well, you know, uh, there is a discourse out there around how to address polarization. So let's pick that as the topic. And so I wanted to uh, demonstrate in the podcast how we would go about tackling what we will call depolarization, you know, the response to polarization, the, the remedy for polarization. And um, I identified seven people in the literature who I thought were the world's like leading luminaries in this discourse. And the vision that I had is that if I reach out to these seven, maybe one or two of them will agree to be interviewed. And um, if they do, that would be really great in terms of us tackling this topic. Um, so I wrote to them and I got no responses. And in fact, I continued, persevered reaching out to them for six months. And again, you know, for the most part, nobody replied. But after six months, finally one of them did. And um, we began collaborating together on a project. And uh, I interviewed him and it went really well. And so then he wrote to the others and said, hey, this was great. I think you should do this interview with Dwayne. And eventually all seven did. And so in Society Builders, we actually have these seven people. And these are incredible people who have incredible experience with the depolarization theme. And what I learned collectively across these episodes, across these interviews, across all the literature that I studied as well, all because I did a lot of reading of the scientific literature on this as well. And what I learned is that if you take the insights around what has proven to work, what scientifically we can say is effective in depolarization, and if you map these, they're all very basic Baha'i principles. And so the big takeaway from this, from this journey really is that if you do the Baha'i thing, you're actually practicing good science in the path to depolarization. And, and this is very interesting. One of these leading luminaries is a, a, a reporter, an award-winning reporter named Amanda Ripley. And in her book, which is called High Conflict, um, Why We Get Trapped and How We Get Out, and in her book, she goes all over the world. She goes into the jungles of Colombia. She interviews FARC rebels who are mediating you know, with the government in serious journalism. And she, she does a, it's an amazing book. It's a beautiful summary of the scientific literature. And in her journey, she would ask people, is anybody doing this right? And, and somewhere along the line, you know, the people she was interviewing said, have you looked at the Baha'is? And she had, hadn't heard of the faith before. She discovers it in this journey. And she concludes in her book that the only people who are really doing this depolarization business right is the Baha'i community. And she has this sentence in the book, which is incredibly powerful. She says, if social scientists created a religion, it would look like the Baha'i faith. And the thing is, my, my personal understanding when I read this literature, when I listen to these, guess when I look at the scientific evidence is yes. If you look at the scientific evidence that has come out around what is effective for depolarization, it's Baha'i 101. They're all very basic Baha'i principles. And so um, this is really why um, this is so powerful. It's why this journey was so fulfilling for me personally, because this was a journey of discovery, of course, for me. And now I'm very engaged with that particular discourse. And I've now created a, a new podcast, which is called Depolarizers, which continues that journey. And society building, in society builders, we're now moving on to social action. So we have to continue our journey around society builders. You know, that was 
um, a juicy little tidbit that we got along the way, but we have to continue our journey. But depolarizers is this Baha'i inspired dialogue around depolarization. Right now in America, across the world, there is a lot of polarization around politics. I think we see it more and more every day. So just at a, an individual level, interacting with other human beings, other souls, uh, how do we go about doing this in a way that diffuses conflict? Well, it's not just politics. Politics is very visible, but there are reasons why polarization is accelerating so rapidly. Um, one of the main uh, catalysts for it is social media. Uh, we've moved from a world where we had this standard for objective news. Even if we fell short, there was still some goal for the news to be objective. That's gone. That is dead in the gutter. Nobody is aspiring to practice objective news anymore. Now social media has created a different kind of approach. And, um, you know, it's about uh, algorithms that reward extreme views. Um, you know, if you have a conspiratorial kind of like story and a credible story from a credible publisher, the algorithm actually favors the conspiratorial because it knows that it accelerates more. There are commercial reasons for that, but it's not just commercial. There are what are called chaos actors. Chaos actors are whole military divisions in foreign countries who have these divisions that are sowing the seeds of dissension, who are creating, you know, on the one hand, they're f funneling stories that are, you know, uh, trying to agitate black Americans against white Americans. And then in the next breath, they're doing the same thing with white Americans against black Americans. And there's an active effort out there, a massive effort to create and cultivate polarization. It's not happening by accident. And then we also have this other problem where the nature of our communication is increasingly occurring within echo chambers, where we're hearing people who have views that are like ours and not hearing people who have different views. And that gets reinforced. And so there are reasons why polarization is so rapidly accelerating all over the world. Um, but when you think about what polarization is, the opposite of polarization really is unity. And the cornerstone of what Baha'u'llah's message is all about is unity. And so this is the exigency of our age. This is the problem almost above all which the society of the world that we live in today needs remedy for and in our practices around consultation you know um, it's not just about the ideas that we bring it's about the method it's about the manner it's about the how we go about doing what we do um, the most important concept in all of this really is a very profound idea and it's an idea that I think most Baha'is don't understand. And that is that when we say the oneness of humanity, that is a paradigm. That is a lens through which we look through everything in our lives. That means we understand how the world is one social organism. That's a paradigm. It's a whole unique way of looking at everything. From that lens, there is no us and them. That's a challenge for Baha'is. You cannot look to the world around you and dehumanize people. You can't think, oh, these people are Trump supporters. I don't agree with their views. They're evil. They're bad. They're dehumanizing. Even the Iranian regime, which persecutes us, we don't vilify them. We certainly don't agree with their actions. We certainly call them to respect human rights, but we don't vilify the regime. And tomorrow, if the regime were to fall, we would not be advocating that they, you know, be killed and murdered and, you know, like that's not our style. We are about moving on. We're about moving forward. We have a very, very, very positive vision of the world we're trying to build. And it's a unifying vision but it's one in which we have to recognize that we are all fundamentally part of the same social organism. We don't have an us versus them. Whew. Oof, that is a very powerful idea for us to grapple with. How do you think that we can internalize that? Well, um, we have to recognize that there are competing influences in our life. 
The faith is an influence. When we go to work, there's a culture in our work environment. That's an influence. When we watch television, there's a culture that's re rewarding us for certain things. That's an influence. And increasingly, we have to recognize that you know, we have to proactively make the decisions about who we want to be, about you know, this is that principle of coherence, that yes, there's a material dimension to our lives, but there also has to be a spiritual dimension. And we have to make sure that we're nurturing the spiritual as well, proactively. And so this is the challenge of reflection for us, to constantly bring ourselves to account. Um, you know, you read a social media post, you're outraged, you're angry. It's the reptile brain in you, you can't help it, but pause and reflect. You know, the House of Justice calls for this etiquette of expression, you know, be moderate in your tone. Stop yourself from adding fuel to the fire, right? This is the daily practice of us taking what we consume, what we transmit, and just becoming much more conscious and aware to empower our divine self, to empower our spiritual self, to empower our spiritual identity and not just run with our reptile brain. I think that's a great place to close. Thank you so much.